Hello and welcome everyone to Conversations with Tona Brown. I am sitting here with an icon in our community. His name is Keith Boykin. Keith Boykin is a TV and film producer, national political commentator, New York Times bestselling author, and a former White House aide to President Bill Clinton. His latest book is Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, Keith has taught at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University and currently teaches at City College of New York. He is a co-founder and first board president of the National Black Justice Coalition and a Lambda Literary Award-winning author of five books. Congratulations on that. Keith was a co-host of the BET talk show, My Two Cents, starred on the Showtime reality television series, American Candidate, worked as an associate producer of the film Dirty Laundry, and has appeared on numerous TV shows, including BT's Being Mary Jane. I just want to take our time to show this man some love. Um, and I also want to let people know how I met Keith many years ago while I was still in college studying violin performance and music. So welcome Keith Boykin to the show. Hello Keith and how are you? Hi, John. I'm doing really well. It's been a long week, a long day, but I'm hanging in there doing well. Oh, I'm sure. Let me tell you, this has been the highlight of the season that I get a chance to actually speak to you in person. And what I like for people to know about all of us that are out here doing the work is who are we as people? Because I think that sometimes we're branded a certain way and people don't get a chance to get to know us. So first, I want to share a story with everyone about how I met you. And that was at Shenandoah University. Um, it had to be either in the late 90s or early 2000s, because so that's when I was there. So it was 98 to 2000. <laughs> yeah, I'm dating us a little bit, but it's okay. You still look fabulous, okay? <laughs> And during that time, you came to our school to speak. Um, you were promoting one of your books at the time. And I just re remember seeing the most distinguished gentleman I'd ever seen walk in. You looked like five million bucks. And when you started talking, in the middle of it, as all of the student body was really engaged in what you were talking about, there was this man that came who was not a student. And he came and started heckling me. Um, he asked you all these questions about the Bible and did you think that, you know, being gay was was okay and all ignorant. And we were appalled. You were appalled. And of course, we had no idea how you would lead to that. But you kept your calm. I don't know how you did it. And you had a report for everything he had to say in a very professional manner. And you moved on. And it helped me to realize in my activism as, as for the transgender community and LGBTQ people of color, it helped me to realize that if you're going to do this work, there are going to be people like that. And you have to know how to handle it. And I remember coming up to you afterwards saying how impressed I was at how you handled it. Um, I wasn't Tona at the time. I had not transitioned at the time. But I remember... Um, seeing you and it just made such a lasting impression and that's why I wanted to bring you on the show. So tell us a little bit about your background and like where are you first of all where are you bringing where is where the board? Hmm. So you drink take a great drink of water right in <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, well thank you John I appreciate that introduction and that background through which I uh, did not recall but uh yeah, I've been to so many colleges and universities over the years. I've had that experience where people have attempted to have tried to heckle me for various times, uh, either during my speaking or after my speaking. Um, so I'm familiar with that. Um, I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri. I was born uh, there a uh, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to mention the year. I say, hey, why not? Um, um, and um, I've, I've lived everywhere. I, I went to three different high schools. Um, and part of what I've learned is that I've always been an outsider wherever I've been because I never really fit in anywhere. 
And when you are an outsider, you learn to sort of either adjust or you learn to uh, come into terms with accepting your own identity. Mm -hmm. And you also learn how to fight. And I don't mean like fight, <laughs> but, but learn how to fight for what you believe. Learn how to stand up for your beliefs. Uh, because I've always been an outsider politically, too. Even I remember back in high school, I went to a, a predominant, one of my the high school I graduated from was an overwhelmingly white high school, an up, upper middle class area of uh, Florida, Clearwater, Florida. And I became the first black student, uh, black student government president at the high school. Uh, even though I was totally out of sync with, I think, the majority of my classmates politically. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was a reflection of the fact that I stood up for what I thought I what I thought was right, what I believed in. Um, and I've always been willing to do that wherever I went. I went to college, a place called Dartmouth College, which was very conservative in the 1980s. Um, a lot of the Fox News hosts that we see today came from Dartmouth College. Uh, Laura Ingram was uh, uh, in college a, a year or two before I was. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who's famous conservative today, uh, was also at Dartmouth College. And all these people were there before I was there at the same time I was there. And that I knew I was getting into a very conservative climate. And I went there and because of that, because I wanted to be in a place where I could sort of debate these issues and talk to people about things where I fundamentally disagreed with them and learn from their life experiences, but also share my experience about who I am as a person. Absolutely. And what inspires you to get into activism, though? Because all of those things for, for you being such an intelligent man, I could totally see. But what made you say, you know what, I want to speak and represent my community? Well, I never really made a decision to get into activism, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like I never even decided, I never even defined myself as an activist. I've never really called myself that. Uh, but I think it all started when I was in law school. Um, and when I, was in, when I was in college, I was the editor in chief of our campus daily newspaper. So I'd seen all these active activism was taking place on campus then. We were, there were a lot of protests that were taking place about the issue of, of South Africa and our college had been invested in South Africa. Then, uh, when I went to law school, the issue was diversity and the fact that there was so little diversity in the law school faculty. Um, and one day I remember just standing outside a faculty meeting with other students uh, while the, the professors walked out, completely ignoring the issue that we were there to, to, to talk about, to, to focus on diversity. And the dean of the law school walked by. And the dean kind of ignored everybody. So I called out to him. I said, hey, Dean Clark, come back and talk to us. The dean turned around, didn't say anything, called out to him again. Hey, come back and talk to us. Once again, the dean turned around and ignored me. So I grabbed my backpack, um, slung it over my shoulder and took the sign I was carrying, put it under my arm. And I began to, to go to get to the dean as he was leaving the building. And the dean of the Harvard Law School, when he saw me coming, literally opened the door and began sprinting across the campus to get away from me. So uh, one of the things I forgot to mention is that when I was in high school and college, I ran track. So I began sprinting oh. across the campus and catch up with the dean. And I, you know, I ran after him. And uh, the photo, there's a photo uh, that appeared of me chasing the dean of law school across the campus that appeared in the Boston Globe the next day. And because of that, I think I became sort of infamous on campus. It was the beginning of this uh, sit-in that we, we took place in. Uh, took part in and the beginning of uh, a season of activism in, in, in law school. I think that kind of opened the doors to me for other types of activism. Uh, so when I left, uh, after I left law school, I went to uh, work for a law firm and then worked for the Clinton campaign and then worked in the White House. And then I left the White House to go uh, to work for um, the National Black Lesbian Gay Leadership Forum. And that was like my first real activist job. That was in the 90s. Uh, where I was executive director. I'm going too fast, right? Yeah, yeah. But first, can we go back to like, hello, you work for Bill Clinton. Like, can we talk about that? How did that job even happen? Like, how did you go from going to school and now you're the house aide to President Bill Clinton? That's phenomenal. Well, it was kind of unusual in that, um, well, a couple of things happened. First, I came out in 1991, quote unquote, came out, um, came to terms with my own sexual orientation. Um, and in that same year, Bill Clinton came to campus at Harvard and he spoke and I saw him speak and I was very impressed by him as a candidate and I thought he might have a good chance of winning. So when I graduated from law school in 92, I uh, uh, immediately 
well, almost immediately quit my job working for a law firm uh, in California because I got this offer to work on his campaign. And I'd worked on other campaigns before. That's the reason why I got the offer. I've been working on campaigns since the 1980s. I worked on a campaign in 1982 for a congressional candidate who lost. I worked on a campaign in 1984 for a presidential candidate who lost. I worked on a, candidate, a campaign in 1986 for a congressional candidate who lost in 1988, for a presidential candidate who lost in 1989, for a local <laughs> candidate who lost. So by 1992, you know, nobody thought it was a good idea for me to get involved in politics. I'd never worked for anybody who won anything before. But suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I quit my job, this well-paid, this high-paid job working for this law firm and went to Little Rock, Arkansas on my beat-up Hyundai Excel, drove halfway across the country, started working for Bill Clinton. And nobody was more surprised than I was when he actually won because I'd never worked for anybody who won anything. And then suddenly I got offered to work in the White House as a special assistant to the president. So it was this dramatic turn of events that I hadn't anticipated, but it all led to me becoming the highest ranking openly gay person in the Clinton That's White right. House at that yeah. time. Uh, it was just, you know, it, it, sometimes I think of my life as sort of like the, the a black gay Forrest Gump. I don't know if you ever remember the Forrest Gump yes. movie, but he just, he just happened to be all these places at the, at the right time and it just, it's odd. Like I went to law school with, with Barack Obama, too. I had no idea when I was in law school that Barack Obama was going to become president of the United States. One of my professors in law school was Derek Bell, who was one of the founders of the critical race movement. I took a class with, with him, you know, and I had no, no idea that critical race theory was going to become this big controversy in the country uh, some 30 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just happened, it just happened to be at all these different places in my life at different times. Uh, and it's just kind of taken me from one place to another. And here I am now with you. Yeah. And one thing is um, I always try to let people see through our stories um, how they can succeed as well, because I think that there are so many people who give up too soon, you know, and I think that what you're telling us, if I'm hearing correctly, is that you were, have just always been very focused. You've always been very focused and how it's taking you from like doing campaigns and now next thing you know, you end up with the president of the United States. That's well, really interesting. I don't know if focus is the right word I would use. Uh, <laughs> I would say instead of focus, I would say that I think I've been committed to my to my values. I okay. And so sometimes there's called some lack of focus because I'm willing to go here, there, wherever in order to sort of follow those values. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess if I'd been focused, I would have just stayed in politics my whole life. But I chose to leave that to go, as you said, in activism and media and other, other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think I've just kind of followed wherever my heart led me to go. And actually, I'm working on a new book, an e-book uh, that deals with these issues right now. <laughs> sort of my life life career trajectory, which I can't really talk about yet, but I'll be talking about it in the coming months. Of but course. yeah, it's it's just it's just it's just kind of like being open to wherever the possibilities may way, may take you, but also mm -hmm. understanding and appreciating the idea that failure is a part of life. You know, I one of my favorite accounts of this comes from Ian Le Benzant. I think mm -hmm. in her book Value in the Valley. Yes. Says that life is not about climbing, is not about jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop. But mm -hmm. instead, you have you climb up to the mountaintop, you reach the peak, and sometimes you have to go back down the valley and then climb back up. You know, yeah. she says there is value in that valley. You know, when you even when you reach this pinnacle, this point of success, that you go back down and then you and it may be humbling, but it you know, it's a process of 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 learning more about who you are and what you want and what's important to you, what's valuable to you in, in your life as you sort of climb or claw your way back up to the next mountaintop, next adventure, the next opportunity, the next journey. Well, I think why, why most people would consider it focus is simply because you were still doing the same general things. You still kept your integrity. You still were doing, whether you won or not, or whether the candidate won or not, you still were doing that. And that that would be considered someone who is focused against all odds is what is what I think most people would see that as. But I totally agree with you, um, even with myself, like after performing for the president, um, Barack Obama and, and doing Carnegie Hall, what else was there for me to do? So I had to figure out, you know, those were the pinnacles for me as a classical artist. And everyone's like, oh, wow, what's next? 
And so you have to kind of rebrand and figure out what is next. And sometimes you reach a certain goal and you realize, wow, I need to make new goals, right? Like that, I thought that that was so far away, but it's not. So I'm just really appreciative of you not only talking to us, but giving us some of the wisdom that you've had from life experience. And that leads us to the next point is that you have another book called Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America. Can you tell us about that and, and what inspired you to write this book? Absolutely. This is my new book, Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America. That came out last uh, fall, last September. And um, it's basically a response to what's going on in our country. It's a response to what you even see today with the Senate confirmation hearings for Katanji Brown Jackson. The idea that they're spending all this time talking about critical race theory and all these, these irrelevant cases from, from decades ago, or, or they're, they're talking about confirmation battles that took place in the 80s and the 90s. It's, it, it, there is, a, there is a, a culture war going on in this country, and it is being led primarily by white, conservative, heteronormative, Christian identified, I use that word in quote, Christian identified um, so-called traditionalists who want to go back in time, who want to turn back the clock. You know, when they say make America great again, uh, that means there was some time in the past, in the past, when they think America was better than what it is right now. And they started saying this when Barack Obama was president, remember? Yeah. Right. Before we had a black president, before we had a black vice president, before we had a black woman who was nominated to the Supreme Court, before we had marriage equality, before trans people had rights in this country, before immigrants were treated fairly in this country, before oppressed and disenfranchised and marginalized groups of people had a fair shake at the opportunity that was guaranteed or supposedly guaranteed to people in this country, that's the time they want to return to, to a time when, as I call it, mediocre white guys like Archie Bunker from the All in the Family TV show in the 1970s could find their way and everybody else was screwed. That's a, that's a backward, atavistic, anachronistic notion of America that most of us don't want to return to. But there is a small vocal group of people who are committed to that, so committed to that that they will do everything in power to stop that progress from changing. That we even have an insurrection, attempt to overthrow the United States government in order to subvert democracy, to prevent this emerging majority of black and brown and people of color who don't necessarily represent their values and identity. And that's what this book is all about. That's what the war that's going on right now, we have to be prepared to respond to that because you can't just assume that the passage of time alone will be enough to change things. Although we think all those old people will just die off and everything will be okay. That's not necessarily true. Some of the people who are in the Senate confirmation hearings today are very young people who are still fighting those arguments and battles from the generations before because they know there is a vested interest in a particular set of the community in fighting that war. That's what this is about. We have to understand that, that these people are willing to do anything and everything to stay in power, to prevent that change from happening. And a Census Bureau report came out in 2015, right before Trump ran for president, that said that by the year 2044, white Americans will no longer be the majority of the U.S. population. And that data point, that statistic, that fact, scares the devil out of these people. They're afraid that they will lose their majority, lose their power, lose their privilege, lose their white supremacy. And so they want to force everybody back into the closet, back into the past, back into the back alleys, back into the places where they did not have the freedom to be themselves. That's right. Yeah. And so we can learn about these things and more from your book. And how can people get a hold of your book? 
Well, you can find the book um, on any sort of online platform where books are sold. You can find it at your local bookstore. You can also find a link to it on my website, which is keepboykin.com, or you can go to the uh, to the link for Race Against Time uh, at Bold Type Books, uh, which is the publisher of the book. So there's lots of different ways you can find it. You just type in Race Against Time, Keep Boykin. Uh, in your in Google or your search engine, you'll come up with a link to, to where you can buy the book. Absolutely. And I am, I want everyone to go and support this man and his word, because I'll tell you, it's not a lot of people out here that are out here doing the good fight. And I bring those people on my show for, for a reason. And also, I want to ask you, too, um, what do you think we can do? Um, those of us that are in community, no matter what the community is, what do you think we can do to not only support you, but other people like you more? And what is your call of action that you think we all should be doing more of? Well, I think we can support ourselves. It's not just about supporting me, but supporting ourselves, supporting our community. You know, there's a, a great slogan from the environmental movement, which is think globally and act locally. So you think globally about what type of world do you want to see? Uh, what do you want to see that's changed? And then you act locally by making those changes within your community, within your family, within your peer group, uh, within your, your colleague and coworker group, uh, within your social network. Uh, when you start to make changes with the people with whom you interact, that's how the world changes. You don't have to always go to the top, quote unquote, because change happens from the ground up. Change happens when enough people at the bottom say that we're fed up with the way things are. and We want things to be different. So yes. uh, that's the first and most important thing that people can do. Uh, that doesn't matter whether you are, quote unquote, ally or whether you're a member of a community that you start from where you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Wherever that may be, your church, your, your, your temple, your synagogue, your school, your family, your, your job, uh, your friends, that's where you start to make the change. You start to change that behavior, to have those conversations and the model, the behavior that you want to see in the world and the way you conduct yourself as well. Well, one thing I will say, too, is that I work with students of all ages um, as a musician, um, and I go around to colleges and universities after seeing role models like you, and I speak and perform. And I will say that the younger generation is so much more in tune with different issues and things, but... What kind of advice would you give some of them who are thinking of going into activism, politics, or anything like that? Um, what advice would you give them? And, and second, um, how do you continue to advocate without burnout or getting tired or, you know, staying angry all the time, that kind of thing? Who says I don't stay angry all the time? <laughs> There's so much to be angry about, but... Ooh. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. King said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, it's it's not an easy fight. It's not a quick fight. We're going to be fighting these battles for our lives and for the lives of our children and grandchildren. Know that first. But it doesn't mean that you don't engage in the fight. It doesn't mean you give up and go away and decide not to do anything. It means that you figure out a way to, to, to do so that doesn't cause you the burnout. Uh, I don't believe in, first of all, I have to say this, I know this may be politically incorrect or unpopular to say, but I don't believe in this no days off mentality I hear so much about on the internet and social media. I don't care whether you're talking about your, your physical health or working out or whether you're talking about work in general. I don't believe in this whole sort of capitalist mentality that has brainwashed us into believing that we're no good unless we're always working. We always have to be productive. We always have to be doing something. You have value regardless of whether you do anything today. You have value because you are alive, because you're a human. You deserve, you deserve everything that you are entitled to. Uh, and don't let anybody convince you that you have to be constantly engaged in activity in order to, to be worthy in this society or in any society. So I think the first thing we have to do is find ways to take care of ourselves. You know, self-love begins by loving ourselves. If you 
you know, it doesn't matter where you where you get it from. I, I you can get it from from religious references to non or non-religious references in pop culture. I think about uh, the Whitney Houston song from George Benson, "The Greatest Love of All." You know, uh, even though I believe the children of the future, um, I never found anyone who ever who was able to fulfill my dreams as a hero because I found the greatest love of all was inside of me. That yes, was right. the message of that song. It's you don't have to look somewhere somewhere else for hero worship. You can look in yourself and figure out a way to learn, love yourself. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. It's, it's a very similar message to what's taught, I think, uh, even in Christianity. When Jesus is approached by the Pharisees in Matthew 22, 32, 37, they ask, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus says to love the Lord God with your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But you can't mm -hmm. love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself. Ah! And, you know, all the people who think that they're supposed to hate themselves or love the sinner and hate the sin, they're, they're not loving themselves. You have yeah. to figure out a way to love yourself, to take care of yourself, to nurture yourself, to support yourself before you can help anybody else. Even if you go on an airplane, when they tell you if the, if the mask comes down from the ceiling, you first secure your own mask before you help someone else. You have yes, to right. be able to have the have the the sustenance to be able to go on. So I, I think it's important for people to figure out ways within their their peer group to to have support networks, uh, to to seek out people who can help them, to find rest or take periods where they if they can where they they can attempt to rest that they don't buy into this mentality that they always have to be doing something. But at the same time, still stay committed to the goal, stay committed to the cause in ways that, that, that support not only the community, but support yourself. Absolutely. Let me tell you, thank you so much for giving us this knowledge, because um, what I've noticed with all of my guests is that everyone has these little life lessons and little tips that help everyone based off of your own experiences. And I think that what you said is gonna be extremely impactful for those who are listening. And I have to agree 200%. Sometimes people don't like that about me. Like if I need to take time for me, I'm an empath anyway. So if I need to take time for me, I'm going to take it, period. You know, that's just what it is. Um, I work very hard, but at the same time, I relax even harder. So, you know, thank you so much for joining us here on Conversations with Tona Brown. Anytime that you have anything that you want to promote, um, please let me know because I'm always sharing things on my social media and in my Facebook page, especially the Tona Brown with the blue check. Um, I'm always sharing things. We need to show more support of you. We need to show more support of those who are out here doing amazing things, specifically, in my opinion, men of color, because I don't see enough of it. And so I'm trying to do my part, just like you said, starting from what I can do to show more support of you guys. Thank you so, 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 so much. Thank you, Tona. I appreciate you taking time out of your day and your schedule to in invite me to be a part of this conversation. Absolutely. And trust me, you'll be invited again. Thank you for all that you do. And um, do you have anything that you would like to leave people with? Well, first, thank you for what you do, too, uh, for the platform you've created and for the work and legacy that you've left behind. And thank you for sharing that story of how we met, which I didn't recall, but I appreciate that. The only lesson I would leave with people is my favorite passage uh, from one of my favorite writers, which who is Audre Lorde. Uh, who is a, a Black lesbian poet, feminist, activist, um, Lover. writer. And Audre Lorde wrote, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And the reason why I like that passage is because she doesn't say you won't be afraid. In other words, Fear is real. It happens to all of us. Every time we do something unusual or new, there is a fear that we have to overcome to be able to do that. But true courage, true courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to act in spite of that fear. It's, that's you, know, right. you know it's scary. You know you may not want to do it. You know it's uncomfortable, but you do it anyway. That's what courage is. So I just want to tell people and, and re rephrasing or paraphrasing what Audrey Lord said, that when you dare to be powerful and you use your strength in the service of your vision, 
then it will become less important whether you are afraid as well. All right. That, on, on that note, we're going to end this episode of Conversations with Tona Brown. You guys, y'all know I'm a huge fan of Keith Boykin. Um, and we have some exciting um, people that will be coming. We're, I'm going to be interviewing, interviewing Monifa because um, I'm going back to my girl, Monifa. Right. I'm also going to be interviewing Billy Porters very soon. We are going to have these dynamic conversations with people who want to share their life experiences with me and with the world. And so I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I want to thank Keith Boykin again for taking out the time to come and share some knowledge with us. It's time for, in my opinion, it's time for us to support each other more. It's time for us to say, we want to showcase the people that we want the world to see from within our community. Because I was raised by older women uh, my entire life. And that was those were the values that they taught me. And so I just want to share that with the world. And I want you guys to support everyone that comes on my show because they're all phenomenal. Have a great evening, Keith. Thank you so much for coming on Conversations with Tona Brown. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it. You're welcome.